Hi, I'm Kirby Allison, and as you can tell, we're back in London in one of my favorite places with some dear close friends, Edward and Eddie Sahakian. Uh, thank you so much for inviting me back. I always feel as though one day I may be overstaying my welcome, but until that day comes, I'm gonna continue to push uh, for these opportunities to uh, sit here with the two of you here in such an amazing place, uh, enjoying things that we love so dear. So gentlemen, happy new year. We're delighted to have you here. And this is probably the, not probably, definitely the first of our series of interviews. I hope you will give us the privilege of having with you. Let's hope that 2023 will be a good year. Many more cigars, I hope. Yeah, well, we've got some exciting things to look forward to this Absolutely. year. Absolutely, and um, welcome. Thank you. And you will never outlive <laughs> your welcome, Kirby. It's a pleasure and a delight. Yeah. It's what we're all about. Friends and good times. Yes, well, uh, that is uh, one of the great things I think about cigars is that they bring those things together, you know, so often. Uh, and so, uh, you know, we were talking a little bit about, you know, this, uh, this video and what we, you know, might smoke. And it's always a difficult decision uh, in Davidoff of London, of course, with your incredible humidor of fine cigars. But uh, there was something kind of special that was just recently released. Um, and so I thought you might talk about that. Well, Kirby, thank you for that. Um, your timing's impeccable. Uh, the Davidoff number one, it's the signature number one limited edition has just been released, 15,000 boxes of 10, in a size that's iconic. Uh, we love it. Traditionally known as the Lancero or mm -hmm. the Ligito number one in, in Cuban nomina culture. Um, Davidoff, of course, had the number one, both from Cuba and from Dominican in a 38 ring gauge. Mm -hmm. But this one has been fattened ever so slightly. It's a 39 ring gauge mm. by give or take seven and a half inches. Yeah. Uh, I think it's fair to say it's when you want a number two, but have a little bit more time. Yeah. It's that sort of occasion. And uh, I'll come a little bit into, into the blending for the cigar. Um, I personally think it's a little stronger, spicier, richer, perhaps fuller bodied than the very light, creamy mm -hmm. number two. But I'd love to see what you think. Yeah, well, you know, I've, uh, you know, this has been a widely or uh, highly anticipated release uh, because it's an iconic cigar for Davidoff. It's something that they used to make and stopped, and it's been out of yes, production for a long time. It's discontinued for a number of years now. And we're delighted to have it back. Yeah. May I tempt you to ah, pluck one out of the well, box? Uh, thank you so much. Look at this, shall I? Of course. I guess go for the one that's got the gold band on it for me. Um, please, please have a flirt with it. And then, if we may, Dad, would you do the honors for Kirby? Would you perhaps cut it the light for him? It will give me great pleasure to do that. In the yeah. meantime, Dad, why don't you pick yours as well? Uh, thank you, Eddie. I, I thought you'll never ask. Well, <laughs> yeah. I can do the same for yours, Dad. You know, your father, you know, lights a cigar, you know, like uh, none other that I've ever seen. And, um, you know, I think that, you know, as much as I thought I knew how to properly light and to properly smoke and then enjoy a cigar, this is a great example of uh, your and your father's wisdom and just how much there is still for me to learn. Um, so I, I must confess, I rarely, you know, have the patience for a match but I do now exclusively use a yellow flame. <laughs> You're very kind to say that, Kirby. Truthfully, I'm a blue flame man often, uh, which my father absolutely detests. However, I'm often outside. Yeah. Um, you are my excuse for indulging the correct ritual, the yellow flame, the match, the time. Well, you're, company, young yeah, company, you're young and impatient, Eddie. You're young and impatient. <laughs> you have to learn to have patience. Well, Impatient, yes. Young, no longer. Yes, yes. Well, it's like, you know, you know the, the ring gauge, a healthy 38, you know, somehow, kind of how I feel, you know. Maybe <laughs> slightly wider in the waist than, uh, you know, where we should be. Uh, thank you. Just so you notice, the, the pigtail on this mm -hmm. is exquisite. I don't know what we'd call that. It's, it's a very long pigtail. A, a, a very healthy pig, I think. Uh, the virgin puff. Yeah, thank you. Man. I've seen it. I, I would like to cut it for you. No, as well. I would like to ah. cut it for you, if I may. Oh. And I would also like to light it for you. With a 
not the blue flame. <laughs> no, a special nod to, to both yeah. of you, Jeff. Yes, okay. The yellow flame lights a cigar, the, the a blue flame clean. burns a cigar before it lights it. Yeah. Always remember that, Eddie. Yeah. You're very right there. With the, uh, the perfect clean, look at that. Kirby, do you recall the last time you had a number one, I mean, whether Cuban or Dominican? You know, it's funny, uh, you shall ask. Uh, I think the last time I had a number one would have been one of the uh, Cuban Davidoff number ones that we smoked uh, together virtually, you know, during lockdown. You're right. Um, and it was a delightful cigar, pushing 30 years of age, that uh, at that point, and probably still to this day, is the oldest cigar I've smoked. And hopefully the, one of the best. Well, it was exceptional. I mean, that particular cigar with its age, um, you know, was really interesting in its uh, similarities uh, to like a vintage champagne with all these very mm -hmm. subtle yes. kind of yeah. secondary flavors that you just don't find in a new cigar. Uh, the yeast. Um, Thank you, Eddie. The must. It must taste that. much better now that you yeah. lit it for me. Well. Uh, 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 uh. But don't leave yourself out. <laughs> uh, well, these are exquisitely rolled. I mean, you were pointing out that pigtail, and I hadn't noticed it until you had, had mentioned it, but it's, again, such a great testament to how exquisitely uh, rolled all the cigars from Davidoff are. Yes, you're absolutely right. You know, we're, we're in a brave new world, I think, certainly for the last few years of cigars uh, coming from multiple origins, uh, made to extraordinary standards. Mm -hmm. And 20 years ago, perhaps the variety of flavors and tastes that we would get uh, was somewhat limited. Today, they, they are like master chefs, yeah. the blenders you find with all, all of these producers. So it's quite beautiful. Yeah, well the, the, the variety of, I guess, flavor profiles, right, and blends that you find in the non-Cuban kind of new world portfolio is, you know, quite, quite broad. Oh, yes. Um, and you still, still see that, I mean, you know, within the Havana's portfolio of Cuban cigars, I mean, there are a variety of blends, but uh, I would guess the range is much more narrow than what you would find in the new world stuff. Is this something you see, Edward? Well, the new world has come a long way in a very short time. I think we've talked about this in the past and 30 years ago, 25 years ago, if you would have talked about a cigar made outside of Cuba, you didn't even want to hear about it, leave it alone, touch it, smell it or smoke it. And within the last 30 years, but very much so in the last perhaps 10, 15 years, there are some beautiful cigars coming out of yeah. there. Would you say that Davidoff, you know, whenever they transitioned their production away from Cuba uh, to the Dominican Republic, was the first to really commercialize a new world? Uh, it, it was. Well, the first one was, <laughs> it was Dunhill. Yeah. Dunhill at the time used to have cigars made in Cuba, the Cuban Dunhill cigars. And what, what were they called? What was the... There was the Dunhill Club series, and then there was, it was called the Dunhill Cigars. With an R, made in there Cuba. was something that, oh, it'll come to me. Mm -hmm. But uh, that sort of within a few months later, Davidoff had to leave, or decided to leave Cuba as well. Hmm. Uh, Dunhill had a very small, well, Dunhill never had an operation in Cuba. There were some cigars being made for them in a very small quantity. But they were the first one that announced that they're not going to have it made in Cuba any longer. And they moved on to Dominican Republic. And they found a factory called, uh, or based in La Romana. La Romana, that's La what Romana. I was thinking, yes. And they started making a quantity of cigars for them there. Uh, but Davidoff was the first proper cigar manufacturer to set up in Dominican Republic. Yeah. As a matter of fact, when the news came out, Davidoff was moved to Dominican Republic, everybody was surprised. I mean, it was the talk yeah. of the town. How could Davidoff leave Cuba and how could they go to Dominican Republic? Who's heard of Dominican cigars? Yeah. And, but they found the right uh, producer, yeah. Hanky. Hanky. 
Elder. and his family mm -hmm. and the plantations, mm -hmm. the factory. Uh, it was a small, in comparison to what they have now, it was a very small operation. Mm. But Dr. Schneider, he, he could see the long-term wisdom of that. And he said, he told me, he said, we will suffer for a few years, but on the long run, I'm doing the right thing. You just wait and see Edward, and yeah. he was right. I mean, what a visionary. Oh, yeah. And not just that, but uh, you know, to know what may be the right decision, but then to have the courage to, to take yeah. it you yeah. know, whenever at that time. Yeah, I mean, but it also it gave them, the biggest advantage was it gave them absolute control yeah. over the product. From the moment the seed was planted, it was under their supervision, their control, and their ownership in most cases, right up to when the cigar came into our shop and it went mm -hmm. into the hands of a consumer. Yeah. Every box has got a number uh, on the back, a serial number. With that number, you could trace back that box of cigar to when it was made, who was the roller, uh, how many were made, who was the, in charge of the quality control, which tobacco farm it came from. Mm. It goes on and on. It's just fantastic. Mm. That they would have never been able to have any other place. Yeah, that's uh, fascinating. Um, and then here we are today, you know, with this incredible you know, you know, uh, diversity of New World cigars, and especially like in this climate where, you know, the last few years have been very kind of challenging for uh, Cuban tobacco. Uh, I mean, not just the popularity of cigars during lockdown, you know, just people's time to smoke and enjoy them really saw an increase in demand. Um, but prices have gone up. It seems like there, there's fewer available. They're harder to come by. I mean, whereas, you know, you used to be able to find Cuban cigars on, um, you know, a variety of online web shops. And of course, if you're here in London, they're still available, but that's all dried up. And so, um, you know, it's interesting. And I think one of the things that I'm looking forward to talking with you two today about is uh, the variety of just exceptional new world stuff that is available and how there's so much variety there. Yes, uh, yes, you're absolutely right. I think in, in, in the 90s, at least in my living memory, the 90s was the last period of extreme challenge for the Cuban industry, where demand grew exponentially and supply couldn't catch up. Mm -hmm. And at that point, the competition against Cuba from other origins was limited. Mm -hmm. and, and I think fairly, fairly sure the majority would have said Cuban was a better product or more yeah. tasty product. Today, the, the challenge for Cuba and the perhaps the silver lining for, for the consumer and the industry is that there is so much more high quality alternatives. Um, for the consumer getting into cigars, the palate is wide open, yeah. you know, from the Dominicans to the Hondurans to the Ecuadorians to the Nicaraguans, yeah. Costa Ricans, I mean, you name it. Mm -hmm. And Cameroon. the flavors as well, the variety oh, yeah. of yeah. flavor. And so it's like having a chef who suddenly discovered a whole, whole new field of yeah, vegetables of or plants yeah. to use. It's, yeah. it's remarkable. Yeah. So Edward, as someone that's been smoking, you know, cigars for such a long time, I mean, you know, pretty much your entire adult life, um, you know, how have you seen, you know, your palate change or your palate, you know, come to appreciate, you know, the, you know, the diversity that we have. I mean, is that something Certain that you know, aspects like, of my palate have changed? I mean, for, uh, I mean, as you probably have been told by me many times, uh, one of my first and most loved cigar was the Davidoff number two, and that format as well as the blend. Yeah. Uh, and then for a number of years, I started smoking quite regularly the Ambassadrice, mm -hmm. which is a very fine. Mm. I think it's a 20 23, 23, 24 like that, yes. uh, ring gauge. It's almost the size of a cigarette. And I even had special cigar cases made to hold a few of those in my pocket. Okay. Uh, and I would smoke several of them in a day. Then I gradually enjoyed slightly larger cigars. There was something called the Davidoff 1000, which they don't make any longer. It is the shorter version of the number one, probably almost about half the size, around four inches long. And it was, again, at 30, if I'm not mistaken, it was a 38 ring gauge. 
maybe 39. You can beat me yeah. later, but I don't yeah. remember that. <laughs> but as time has gone by, I still don't enjoy very fat, large ring gauge yeah. cigars. Out of choice, I still prefer, a, to me, what is considered a, a classical shape and a classical size of a cigar, which is very much like the number one, but slightly shorter, yeah. exactly the number two. Mm -hmm. that, that is my first choice, time and place permitting when I open my humidor, that's the first cigar that comes out of choice. I do smoke other cigars, obviously. Sometimes I have to, sometimes I like the variety of them. But to go back to it regularly, it's always that sort of a format, uh, nothing more than 40, maybe 42 ring gauge, yeah. no longer than four and a half, five inches long. Yeah. Uh, it's a good daily smoke. Uh, on that mm. note, what I, the first, Number one, which came in two days ago when I saw that Eddie got angry at me because what I did was I chopped off <laughs> one third <laughs> of the head I promise. <laughs> and uh, uh, I lit that up and it was delicious, very nice. And then the two thirds of it, which has brought it down to almost the number two size in the evening after I had dinner at home, I lit up that uh, second part. Uh, so th that is my... Uh, palette at the moment. It might change. It might change mm -hmm. tomorrow. You know, yeah. Every morning you wake up, you know, one day you feel like you want to have a nice steak and the next yeah. day you oh, I want to have a hamburger yeah. and the next day you want to have something vegan. So, yeah. Have you ever wanted something vegan though? No. <laughs> <laughs> For yet. example, you know. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, that's interesting. So uh, what about also, you know, as, you know, again, you look at the portfolio of Davidoff, right? I mean, they've got the Nicaraguan stuff, which is quite dark. Right. I mean, they've got a real large variety of blends. You know, personally, I, I find myself gravitated towards kind of the medium body of stuff, right? I find some of the darker stuff just can be a little too heavy for me. Um, you know, have you found yourself kind of enjoying kind of, again, that variety? And have there oh, been yes, any, very much so. any kind of standouts for you? The David of Late Hour, I love it. Mm -hmm. It's not an everyday cigar for me, but at the right time, right place, it's a delicious cigar. Mm. And also, uh, is that at a late the hour? Nicaragua one. The, the, <laughs> you know. the, all of the Nicaragua blend, I've been begging them if they would make it uh, David of number two size Nicaragua. Mm. Puro, right? So 100% Nicaragua. Yeah, oh, yes, absolutely. Yeah. I hope one day they mm -hmm. will do that. Uh, in tint, uh, Davido. <laughs> but the, the tobacco from Nicaragua has a certain flavor, certain sweetness to it. Mm -hmm. It's a sweetness that you might not taste, but you will smell. Yeah. If you could smell sweetness, you know, it's, it's got a certain lovely, delicious flavor to it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, Eddie, what are you picking up on, on this one? Because mm. it, it's a signature, number one. So it would be a signature blend, presumably you know, of the same blend that you'd find in a number two? Almost, but but they've tweaked this one. Um, I know that the, the binder and the wrapper are from Ecuador, which distinguishes it from the number two signature blend. Uh, whether they've tweaked the, the core, the filler, um, which I believe is principally Dominican, if not entirely Dominican, I'm not sure, the individual leaves. Mm -hmm. For me, there is more body here and initially more spice. Mm -hmm. You know, the, the sort of, the, the, the typical uh, blueprint flavors I get from the number two are cream, very light, mm -hmm. you know, none of the spice and pepper components on, on my palate. With this one, I get more of that. Yeah. Which, but it's still not a strong cigar for mm -hmm. me. I would, I would rank it as a starting off light, moving to medium. Mm -hmm. um, and I think the shape helps, you know, yeah. the, the, the length, the, yeah. the time it gives it to evolve on on the palate and in the cigar. What about for you, Kirby? What, what are you picking up? What well, is a little bit spicier, mm -hmm. kind of at least in the beginning, mm -hmm. of kind of mm -hmm. where we are, where? G we're give at. it a bit of a time. Yeah. Go down further, inch or two, yeah. you will start to see it develops mm. and it does change as well. Yeah, isn't it Davidoff that, uh, you know, uh, has their tasting notes by thirds? You know, mm -hmm. where they, yeah, yeah, you know, they are do. really able to, <laughs> you know, to delineate, you know, with that degree of resolution, the evolution of the way a cigar is smoking uh, over the course of the entire length of the cigar. It's extraordinary. Uh, our mutual friend, Mr. Fuchs, 
derives great enjoyment and pleasure from reading the tasting yes. notes as he smokes the cigar. <laughs> uh, you know, he does it for comedy, but actually, it's shockingly accurate. You're right. Well, he's a, he's a master unboxer also. Oh, you know, yeah. His unboxing videos are amongst uh, the best on, on the interwebs, as, uh, as he would say. Um, yeah, Nick, I always get a, a laugh, a kick out of his and Max's videos. Oh. <laughs> you know, they, they do a, a, such a splendid job. Um, do you think that the pepper and that spiciness, you know, would soften with a little bit of age? I mean, these are brand new. I mean, just fresh off the boat, right? <laughs> Funny you mentioned that, uh, Kirby, because one of my first comments to Eddie was when I s started smoking the first cigar, I said, this is a cigar that's ready to smoke and it's delicious, but give it a few more years, it will be phenomenal. Yeah. It will age beautifully and it, it, it will be even more refined. As it mm. is, it's fine, but it will be yeah. even more refined. And it will, uh, to my opinion, well, I've already put four boxes aside. <laughs> Only four. Only four. Well, I must confess, I've, boxes I've got two ten, waiting you know? <laughs> for me. I've got two waiting for me back at home. Who <laughs> wanted you know? um, uh, Yeah, so that's interesting. I mean, because normally Davidoff would say that all of their cigars are blended to be smoked immediately. Yes. They really don't need any age uh, out of the box. I think that's correct. Uh, and I would extend that beyond Davidoff. I would say... Typically, non-Cuban production seems to be ready to smoke, whatever the flavor expression may be. Um, and we tried in the early years to, to sort of see if we could capture some of the change and evolution in, mm -hmm. in, the, in these that you get very rapidly with Cuban stock. And we didn't see much. However, with hindsight, and of course with 10, 15, 20 years now, uh, we are seeing some um, some non-Cuban production that is is changing, and, and Davidoff included in that. Yeah. Um, so there is absolutely a reason to put it to one side, perhaps mm -hmm. less compelling a reason. Mm -hmm. It's not to improve it as much as some of the Cubans need yeah. for improvement, but, but it will change. But do you find that you know, and did I listen to this correctly? That you know that the the blend is maybe more stable and doesn't you don't see as much of an evolution or change in the profile as you age a non-Cuban as a Cuban. Did I hear that correctly? I mean, again, a matter of opinion, but but for me, um, much of Cuban production arrives with the potential for more micro fermentation to take place, which is where the fundamental um, call it chemistry changes and therefore palate changes. Davidoff um, and I think the majority of, of non-Cuban producers spend more time and energy at the curing and fermentation stage and call it the settling stage where the cigars are still in their custody mm -hmm. and are evolving there, the leaf mm -hmm. itself, either before or after roll. So when it comes out, you can, as we said, you know, take one from the box and you shouldn't have a, in any way, shape or form, an expectation that it needs more time. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Cuba, part of the magic of Cuba has always been that the input of the cigar merchant in the old days, but in these days, it's often the, the end customer is aging it. Yeah. And you have the capacity to, to dramatically improve a cigar mm -hmm. or at least change the cigar in the first three to five years of its life. Yeah. Um, we always say, if you smoke a Cuban you don't like, wait a couple of years. Yeah. Um, and that's true even uh, not just in the first three to five, but like the first, you know, five to eight or five to ten where you can, as I've heard you describe before, that you know, some of the Cuban cigars can kind of have a dip, you know, where maybe Perhaps, there's a period yes. in which they're no. not smoking well, We've, right, but that's very transitionary. We came across <clears throat> that with the original David of number uh, ones from Cuba, Okay, which uh, uh, the, f uh, the last lot that we had was in 1990, 91. Mm -hmm. Yes, exactly. And, and then between 1990 until 2000, it just went down and down. I think Eddie was considering that, that these cigars, you know, we, we would need to possibly <laughs> yeah. sell it at half price. You know, or my something. suggestion was <laughs> we should burn them rapidly. <laughs> yes, one by one. <laughs> <laughs> but and then suddenly around 2000, 2005, 2006, we started smoking one or two here and there, and we realized what difference it had made. Yes. It had completely turned around and come up. It yeah. was incredible. Any other uh, cigars that have surprised you like that? 
that you can think of. I mean, yes, I mean the 3000, the Davidoff 3000, um, again, the Cuban went through a similar profile. Um, strange that it's a very slim ring gauge, mm -hmm. you know, it seems to be the slim gauges that, that do that. Um, I had a similar experience with the Dom Perignon, mm -hmm. uh, one of the iconic Davidoff cigars. And I think the consensus view today would be that most of them have passed their peak okay. smoking period. And, and are now in a state of um, preservation, perhaps, mm. with minimal flavor profiles remaining. Yeah. And, and I tended to agree with, with that until maybe three or four years ago, uh, we cracked open a Dom Perignon and smoked it, and it was stunning. And that is the, call it the magical art, yeah. the miraculous element of aging cigars. Yeah. It doesn't matter who you are, how clever you are, mm sometimes good fortune steps in yeah. and, and you know does something you don't know what it is, yeah. but it does it. Well, it seems to sprinkle itself on the Davidoff of London uh, humidor downstairs. I don't know what the, <laughs> the dust is that you have, Edward, but uh, you know. It's you, dust of love. Yeah, your family. Love of cigars. You know, your family has <laughs> you know, traveled with that dust for generations. You yeah, know? Because when I go there sometimes, I talk to my cigars. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Remember, they're all alive, the yeah. boxes of cigars. Oh on the shelves, in storage, yeah. they're all alive. They're breathing, it's good they're for the fermenting, they're maturing, yeah. and they are alive. Yeah. And I talk to them, why yeah. not? I talk to my car as well, mind yeah. you. Well, you'll be happy to know, I, I walked in the humidor earlier, and I thought Max was on the phone. Nobody was there, you know, talking to the cigars, you know. <laughs> Gazing lovingly. At <laughs> I was like, I'm not interrupting anything, am I? <laughs> He's like, I'm just talking to the cigars. Mm -hmm. I was like, well, <laughs> let me know if they say anything back to you because, uh, mm -hmm. you know, they seem to speak to him also. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, a comment I've seen uh, a few times we, we've been discussing similar topics is, um, you know, people scratch their heads and wonder, how, how, can you, how can you resist the temptation? How can you put cigars away for so long yeah. and, and not smoke them? Yeah, what's the answer to this? Mm. Dad, what's your answer? Patience, patience, patience. How, how do you generate that patience? Because you know it will get better tomorrow. It's like a fine bottle of wine, like a few bottles of wine that I have. Uh, Eddie says, Dad, these wines are ready to be enjoyed now. I said, yes, but it will be even enjoyed more tomorrow. <laughs> I like that mindset because, uh, yeah. you, know, you, know, the, you know, the other kind of prevailing one is, you know, it's meant to be enjoyed now, yes. you know. It's like, um, but I think that there is a virtue to patience and to setting things away and allowing things to mature. Uh, and just, you know, the longer you've kind of held something in your custody, you know, the more you grow to kind of appreciate and love it, you know, kind of like our children, you know, the longer, you know, they're, they're around, <laughs> you know, the more we, the older you know, they get, the better they become. They come to love them, and the, um, the less objectionable. They yeah, <laughs> <laughs> indeed. And just like with cigar, there's a middle period where, like you know, absolutely, well, the teenage years, yeah, yeah, right. Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the teenage years of a cigar. You know, that's, that's why I'm one. stocking up my humidor right now, is yeah. because uh, you know Nathaniel just turned ten, and I know, you know, those teenage years are right around the corner, and I'm going to need something to get me through it. <laughs> no, he's a great child. Uh, although a handful, but great child, you know. As Eddie, I'm sure, is proof, you know, the, you know, difficult children make great adults. <laughs> <laughs> it's like a vine, right? Yes. The more it has to struggle for yeah, nutrients. That's right. The better the wine the it comes out. The better the wine is. Um, <laughs> well, what are some other favorite uh, Davidoffs? Mm. I know you've got a few things hidden over mm. here and I asked you to pull a few to, to speak about. Uh, I'd love to hear, you know, from both of you, you know, just kind of some of your thoughts on, you know, the great kind of limited editions or just current production Davidoffs. I could see a lovely one right at the top there, the Puro Doro. Oh, the Oro Blanc? The Oro Blanc. Oro Blanc. Blanc. The Puro Doro is even rarer now. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, it, can we have some show and tell? Well, I mean, the, the Oro Blanco is, is, is sort of Davidoff uh, it's almost a devotional commitment to producing a, a cigar like no other. And this one, when it was originally talked about some years ago, uh, there had been a, a batch of exceptional tobacco set aside with about 14, 15 years of age. Mm. 
And I believe at the time there was some consideration to use it as a tribute to Dr. Schneider. Okay. Uh, the, really the visionary who took the company where it is today. Mm. Um, that didn't happen, but that tobacco remained and it was exceptional. And I think the concept of the Oro Blanco came out, white gold. And it's a Dominican Puro. So uh, it's an eye opener to see how Davidoff can produce so much nuance and flavor not necessarily strength. I, I would not classify the Oro Blanco as a strong cigar. Um, did it live up to the hype? I think so. I, I think, put aside the, the simple question of, of price, and it is very expensive. <laughs> Maybe not by today's standards, yeah. but at the time it was you know, f- almost 400 pounds. Wow, that's um, still, you know, still you know, it's by today's standards. Oh, yes. <laughs> it was 400 pounds. <laughs> yeah. uh, but I mean, just impeccable. What can I say? It's a cigar. Here it says Special Reserve 2002. Hmm. That dates it. And And is that the date of the tobacco? That's, um, I believe it is. And I also believe it's dating the the sort of laying down of that tobacco for for further maturation. I cannot, uh, or I don't believe they can continue to produce the Oro Blancos using exactly that tobacco. So I think there's an element of continuity Mm -hmm a little bit being set aside from each subsequent year that yeah. matches the quality and flavor profiles, uh, but does go into there. And it produces a, a, a wonderful cigar. This, this had to be an exceptional cigar and it lived up to it. Mm. Um, when was this released? This, was, this first appeared, I would say, probably 2016, 17, something like that, perhaps. Yeah. Even sooner than Maybe that. 18. It was sooner. Was it, it sooner? There were very Five, few pla- shops uh, that had it. It was available in Geneva. We were lucky to have some as well. Yeah. May I see it? Mm. Of course. Um, wow. And, and it has a, a, I mean, the, you know, the silver, or yes. white gold foiling. Um, wow, it's beautiful. I mean, every detail, you know, the yeah. box, the packaging, but of course you can't smoke the packaging. And the wrapper but, color is oh. gorgeous. Just look at the veins of the leaf and just how beautiful that is in the wrapper. Um, and you're saying that this is, you know, I mean, I'd, I'd still falsely associate wrapper color with strength, which you've debunked in your videos. Yes. Um, I would, you know, at first glance think to this to be a, a medium to full-bodied cigar, and you're saying that it was, you know, quite mild to... Medium, I medium, would put it, yeah. yes. Medium with plenty of evolution. Mm. And you know, what, what strikes me still, even looking through the cellophane, is just the texture, the quality, the, um, you know, something that chimes very much with your world, the craftsmanship that's gone into that cigar. I cannot imagine a more beautiful wrapper dressing mm-hmm. a more gorgeously well-made cigar. Mm. Um, you know, there's not a hint of an imperfection there. Yeah. Uh, and of course, whether we like it or not, as cigar smokers, our eyes are part of our palate. Yeah. Hmm. And what was it that you think made that tobacco so special? Was it, is it merely just how long it was set aside or when it was set aside, was it selected for some other set of properties that set it apart from? Uh, it, it, it was both. Um, I remember Henke at the time telling us uh, and Eladio Diaz, uh, at the time he was there, at Davidoff, you know, they had identified it very early on in its in its existence as potential cigar tobacco to be exceptional. Interesting. So they, you know, were able to see the tobacco as it was growing or pulled into the barns and yes, uh, it, you know, cured and dried and everything that it was special. It's it's again, like the, wines, you know, the wine grower from the first moment. He starts picking some grapes. He will taste it, and he will say, "I think this year we're going to have a good wine from this grape." Nobody else could tell, but it's a feeling that a grower yeah. gets. And Hanky and Eladio, I mean, they were experts yeah. on that. Well, and then to sit on it for sixteen years, you know, oh, yes. that pa- degree of that level of patience. Oh. You know. Oh, yes. It's almost like, you know, hide this somewhere in the back, you know, so that we forget about it. But I think Eddie's got some more beauties there. Yeah, that please. He, he well, loves them as well. Well, I'd, I'd like to talk about kind of two cigars together um, because one inspired the other. Um, we've seen this one before and smoked it together before, which was our 40th anniversary mm-hmm. uh, number, number two. Number two, yeah. 
produced uh, or released, I should say, in 2020. And um, untypically for, for the Sahakians, we subconsciously went into it with a richer, fuller bodied blend uh, with an eye to perhaps yeah. uh, its aging potential, mm -hmm. but also something to distinguish it from the normal number two. It is the yeah. same size as the number two, our favorite size. And when we spoke initially to Davidoff, we did the tasting panel, we, we, they said, well, what would you like? Uh, hmm. We had both loved the art edition from 2014 and 2016. Uh, this was a special limited edition project done uh, to support the art initiatives at the mm -hmm. time by Davidoff. And Perfecto shaped cigars using incredibly complex blending. And if I recall, it was a uh, Ecuadorian Habano wrapper. Uh, I believe there was a San Andres uh, Mexican binder, at least in one of them. Mm -hmm. And a combination of Dominican with possibly a, a Nicaraguan leaf in there for good measure. So maybe another five leaves in the filler. And I remember smoking the 2014 and I remember smoking the 2016 and thinking this is amongst the best cigar I've ever mm. smoked. Um, unfortunately, there's not a full box. This the is one I, I whipped out of my locker, which has been <coughs> pulverized to some degree. Uh, uh, this but is, uh, this is the 2016 version. And the complexity wow. demonstrated, the, the, the nuancing, the construction, mm. the, the surprising, at the time, surprising flavors that it brought to the palate, untypically Davidoff, I would have said at the time, um, made us all realize the palate Davidoff is playing with and how restrained they had been <laughs> to date yeah. in expressing it fully. Yeah. So when we talked to them, we said, look, can you do a number two, which is inspired on palate and, and production mm -hmm. by the art edition 2014 and 2016? That's exactly what they did. Um, in here, we have a Habano Ecuador wrapper we have a San Andres uh, binder, mm -hmm. and we have five leaves, which are really difficult to really? fit into a number two size huh. in the filler. And five different it, leaves. Five different leaves. And that's five different oh, blends, yes. like five different. Five different. Not nearly um, five leaves, you know. Absolutely Cram right. the other in a number two, but. No, exactly but, right. Yeah. Um, and that is, I think, why they were able to do what they did. I think it caught Davidoff a little bit by surprise as well, that they could execute such a complex blend in, a, in such a slim format. Mm. Um, so that was inspired by that, but it has given us such a wonderful insight to the skill they have and the abilities they have to, to use all these ingredients yeah. uh, like little magicians. Mm -hmm. uh, so that has to be, you know, amongst my very, very favorite cigars of all time, our own, of course. I've but got I, two boxes of those as well. <laughs> I speak to myself there. Um, <laughs> In more recent years, you know, we've seen, I've got, a, I've got the rabbit here, for example. Mm -hmm. um, we've seen the Zodiac series, and that's getting yeah. on to year 11, I think, now from, yeah. from Davidoff. Mm -hmm. um, that's always been, uh, I suppose the example would be a chef who, who has a signature dish where he surprises or she surprises. Um, I thought the Zodiac series in its first few years was always a surprise. It was a departure from a typical Davidoff yeah. blend. And I think they've continued to do that. What has changed is the rest of the portfolio has started to encroach on some of those extraordinary flavors and mm -hmm. tastes and origins that they've been experimenting with in the Zodiac series. Yeah. So the rabbit for me is medium to full bodied, highly complex. Mm -hmm. um, again, it's a perfecto funnily enough. I don't know why they do perfecto so well, um, but that great example, not just the rabbit in general across the Zodiac yeah. series, and a mistake we made, we didn't stash the early years of the Zodiacs. Hard I believe. wish we had. Hard to believe. Oh, I promise yeah. you. Uh, uh, yeah. It was a blind spot for us yeah. and one which I have rectified in recent years. <laughs> recent but, years. Yeah, that's, um, you know, the Zodiac series, whenever it first came out, was something that I thought initially was, you know, all marketing, you know. But also the quantity didn't allow us to do yeah. that. Mm. Even with this number <laughs> one, uh, we've got a very limited quantity. Mm -hmm. uh, we probably got one fourth of what we would want to have. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's the same with the others. You know, why do you think that is? Is it just the Davidoff's decision not to 
because they don't have the same kind of supply constraints, you know, that, you know, that maybe Cuba has been experiencing, right? And so presumably they could have made more. Not necessarily. I think what they do, they choose the blend of a cigar they're going to make and they allocate the variety of the tobaccos that would need to go you to make that, that yeah. cigar. And uh, once it's done, uh, that's it. Yeah. It's not an ongoing thing, uh, these special ones. The other ones yeah. they do, but when it's a one-off, a limited edition number one, for instance, mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's uh, 15,000 boxes, that's 150,000 cigars. It's nothing, it's a week's consumption for my father. <laughs> <laughs> no, in a way, it's a lot of cigars. Another way, it's nothing. Well, when you think about the global yeah. market, yes. right? I mean, having to allocate across all the countries mm -hmm. in their portfolio, mm -hmm. uh, across all the Davidoff stores, yeah. and uh, you know, their other independent retailers, it's really not that much. But people I mean, have become very wise, cigar smokers. They become very wise now when they see a good cigar. They don't just buy one to smoke now or a box to enjoy this month. Uh, they buy a box to smoke and they buy another two, three boxes mm -hmm. to keep. Yeah. P purely and exactly for the same reason what we're talking about yeah. now. Because they know if they put it aside, next year it would be even better, the year after mm -hmm. even better, and so on. Yeah, and the fact that you just won't, if you you know happen to fall in love with it, like you won't be able to find it you know, past that release. Oh, yes. right? I mean, unlike standard production, yes. right, which one of the things, of course, you know, that we all love about standard production cigars is the fact that you can come back and buy them year after year. Um, and, uh, you know, we all have our favorites, right? Um, but these limited editions, like, that's it, you know. Yeah. Once they're gone, you know, you can't find them anymore. Yes, uh, and, and the parallels to the whiskey market are, are exemplary. You know, if you imagine the limited editions are single cask bottlings, mm -hmm and regular production, ongoing production is, is, the, is the house blends that are produced. You know, when a cask is gone, it's gone. You will never, ever, ever be able to recreate that exact flavor profile again, except by accident. And it's yeah. the same with these cigars. Once that limited edition blending is finished and done, the tobacco is gone. Mm -hmm. Even if Davidoff wanted to, I don't believe they could exactly recreate those amazing cigars um, so it's an impetus to, to, of course, acquire it. Yeah. Uh, and even if you don't like it, you, someone else will. Mm -hmm. So I think there's a little bit of speculation in the market today as well. People acquiring with a view to perhaps, if they're not going to smoke it, someone else will eventually want to buy it from them. Yeah. Perhaps for a tidy profit. Mm -hmm. Perhaps for a trade. Yeah. Yeah. In this in day and age, I mean, I feel like you know, we're all being turned into hoarders. Mm. You know, whereas before, you know. Uh, we would have considered ourselves collectors, you know, now faced with supply shortages, you know, we have all turned hoarders. Uh, I'm in the process of constructing a walk-in humidor to hopefully rectify storage uh, constraints I have at the moment. How is uh, it coming along? Well, it's coming along nicely. Actually, I got a, a photograph texted to me uh, from the office earlier that the cabinetry has arrived. And uh, there's a company in the United States called Vigilant, uh, that I you know, had known about, but not much, that uh, surprisingly specializes in the construction of large humidors, mm -hmm. right? Which I was always a, under the understanding that outside of, um, you, know, you know, Italy, you know, Deart, I think, is one of yes. the big, well-known humidor manufacturers that does a lot of the work, you know, for the premium lounges here in London, Mm -hmm. Our good friend Sherry is, uh, has a humidor from mm -hmm. them that I think you know he's installed in his new home. Um, but outside of that, I thought that was kind of it. And so, you know, whenever I kind of started on this idea, I started kind of, you know, Googling around and stumbled upon this company. And so they started first and foremost as a humidor maker because the gentleman that owns the business, Charlie, is a big fan of cigars uh, and couldn't find anyone to do you know, nice humidors and large cabinets. So he said, well, I'll get into the business of doing that. Uh, they've since turned into a company that probably does more wine cellars than they do, you know, humidors. Um, but they're able to do it, so they've designed something beautiful that I'm hoping will be a real showpiece. Oh. One day, you know, I'd, you must come 
I was going to say, I kind of you know, wait to see it. We're um, looking forward to see it, mm-hmm. and um, you know, I'm I'm really excited about it. To have a proper, you know, place to be able to put things over, put things down for more more time, while still admiring them. The problem with my current humidor is the jigsaw puzzle. Yeah. You know, it's like Jenga. Yeah, it's like Jenga. I mean, I tried to move some boxes around the other day, and I moved them around to kind of rotate them around and I couldn't get them all back in. (laughs) Mm -hmm. I was like, "Ah, I shouldn't have done this. Um, And it's a large, I mean, it's a full, you know, one of those wine cabinets, you know. Mm -hmm. Uh, Whatever size you think is enough, double it, if not triple it in your head because (laughs) you will always need twice as much. That was the advice given to me by a good friend and so we ended up widening it in the middle of the production, (laughs) you know, to allow for a little bit more room, space for the cameras, as I said. You know, so that's good. It's really exciting. I'm excited about that. Oh yeah. Well, please, when it's completed, let us know. I keep promising, and I will. I will do it. I'm going to come and see you in, in California. Texas. You know, Just I've got cousins over. all over the states, but yeah. I have. I feel like I have family in Texas, so I'm. You do have to family visit in you. Dallas, indeed. <laughs> um, and then we're building a house right now. And, you know, my one non-negotiable with my wife, if such a thing exists, right? I'm fooling myself in thinking that, you know, that, that somehow is a concept, you know, it's a conceit more than anything else, is to be able to smoke inside our formal living room. And I'd reference Mr. Edward Sahakian and his beautiful, generous <laughs> wife, Greta, you know, and letting him get away with smoking. So uh, I'm going to be installing one of those massive cam cleaner units that I have in my office, which, you know, uh, honestly, I'm a little bit worried it may not even fit in the attic. We're gonna have to uh, disassemble <laughs> the attic door just to fit it up. Um, but it's my, it's my Hail Mary, you know, to be able to get away with uh, smoking inside. Oh, it's a dream. And, and I'm sure you will execute it beautifully, uh, Kirby. It's well worth the wait. Yeah, well, you know, so it'd be a pleasure one day to welcome you to uh, to Dallas, of course, uh, with his, uh, uh, you know, our kind of trademark Texas hospitality. What's a uh, good time to travel to Dallas? You know, I think in the fall, you, know, you know, kind of not, not in the summer months. <laughs> can be quite September, stifling. September, October. Yeah, September, October are two beautiful months. Mm-hmm. Um, but it would be an absolute honor to invite you, you know, to our home and to actually be able to enjoy yes, cigars together indoors. It would be a great indoors. pleasure and a privilege for us indoors. to visit yeah. there. Yeah. You may find uh, two uh, recently arrived refugees squatting <laughs> yeah, in your right. house. <laughs> well, you know, we'll have uh, the locker, leave, locker, yeah. you know, yes, lockers available for you in the humidor, <laughs> you know. Um, and we're currently in the process of uh, uh, tearing out the sheetrock in the house and having to replace the ductwork because apparently flex duct uh, it only is rated to 350 cubic feet a minute. And if you try to push any more air through that, it rips mm-hmm. apart which was a small detail that I had overlooked. Mm-hmm. So we're replacing it with metal ductwork to be able to mm-hmm. even make this all work. It's one of these uh, you know, challenges of getting committed to the idea of something. And well, also, yeah. you're a perfectionist, right? I mean, uh-huh. anything you're gonna do, you're gonna do to the best of your abilities. So I'm the same. Uh, the question is, is what cigar do we smoke you know, together in Texas? <laughs> yeah. Texas Lancero? Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Well, that's a great one to ponder. Yeah, I'm sure we could come up with a few uh, few ideas on yeah. that. And uh, not to jump the gun, right? But uh, we also, um, you know, have the privilege of traveling to Cuba together mm-hmm. in a month's time. To say it, which I'm very much looking forward to. We are so excited, Kirby. So we've been talking about this for years now, and it's finally coming to fruition. When Eddie mentioned that to me, that Kirby might be coming to Cuba at the same time. I just couldn't believe it. I said, this is a dream come true for us. You know, <laughs> well, for it's me. wonderful to welcome you here, but to be at the other end where it's all being yeah. done and put together, to see it together, to feel it, touch yeah. it, smell it, I, I'm very much looking forward yeah. to it. Um, so what, uh, what should I expect? I mean, what, uh, you know, you both, of course, had the privilege of traveling to Cuba on numerous occasions. This will be my first, first time well, I'll start from the other end. If you love cars, old cars, there's plenty of it around to see. Mm. <laughs> and uh, 
the hotel will be staying. It faces a square where most of them park right there. Mm. It's just unbelievable. Yeah. Uh, it, it, it's like stepping back in time a little bit. Absolutely. You know? It's like uh, opening that magic door and walking into 50 more, 60 years back. Yeah. Yes. Do the cigars taste better in Cuba? Of course they do. <laughs> uh, when you're there, somehow the rum tastes better, the cigars taste better, and your constitution. I mean, I'm usually a one cigar a day guy. In Cuba, even when I try and moderate, I'm at five, six, sometimes <laughs> 10 cigars a day without destroying my throat. Mm -hmm. I would say a couple of precautions, you know, because I made that same mistake the first time I went. You jump in, in two days, you get through 50 cigars. Yeah. The third day, you lost your voice. Oh. So That's happened to me once, you know, yourself. here with you yeah. gentlemen, <laughs> <laughs> which were allergies. I think we just got finished publishing all those videos and, you know, people on the channel have, have, have thought that I've been sick for like six months. <laughs> you know, I was like, no, it's three days. Uh, yeah. you, you, what you will encounter most of all it's the people, they're lovely people there. Mm -hmm. The people you meet there, everybody who goes out of their way to be helpful, they're very hospitable. Yeah. Uh, obviously we're cigar lovers, uh, lots of cigars. Uh, one precaution, don't buy any cigars in the streets. Yeah. There's plenty of fantastically named cigars, yeah. but they're all fakes. Yeah, was, so don't be tempted with that. Someone was texting me on uh, Instagram that he bought a box of Cohibas on the beach. I was like, yeah, well, you know. Highly likely to be real. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, as long as, uh, you know, as long as you think you're smoking a Cohiba and then allow it to, you know, bring you that same pleasure. Um, well, I, I was meeting with Gemma at Hunters and Francao, which, of course, is who invited us. Um, and... Uh, she gave me an idea for a video that, of course, hopefully is amongst the many that we filmed together in Cuba. But I thought maybe we could end with me planting the seed in your minds. Uh, she said, you know, one of the great things about Cuba is oftentimes, you know, people bring their favorite cigars back to the country to enjoy. And so she suggested maybe one of the ideas for a video would be, you know, us, you know, somewhere you know, splendid like the Hotel Nationale or somewhere on the terrace. Each, on the terrace. Right, yes. And to each bring one of our favorite cigars to smoke, you know, there together. Wonderful. So idea. something different. So you guys will have to ponder that and think, you know, if we had I don't have to think much about it. Yeah. Okay, well, my, I know what I'm going to bring. Uh, it can't be a Davidoff number two. It has to be something being repatriated back to the country. Um, and so don't, don't, don't tell me, but it'll be, you know, a cliffhanger for everyone watching. Mm -hmm. the, we know, shall. Keep them guessing for whenever we're there. I think I know, I think I know what it is I'm going to bring as well. You know, you will enjoy your trip and it will be very educational for your viewers as well. Because it's, yeah. it's, a, uh, it's a must. I think anybody smoking a cigar one day must visit Cuba. Yeah. I'm not talking about politics or anything like yeah, that. Of course. It's just the country itself, the people. Uh, the what's plantations, so the production. What's so important to divorce those two, mm -hmm. right? Which is regardless of what you think and believe about the politics, you know, as you said, the Cuban people, the culture, um, you know, irrespective of that, which, you know, let's be honest, none of us can control politics, right? Um, uh, but the people are great and, you know, they're passionate, they're talented, uh, and uh, they're lovely, you know, from what I hear. Yes. And so I'm really looking forward to experiencing I, I hope you do that. like rum. You know, because absolutely. that's what we drink. That's we don't drink wine. <laughs> no. During meals, dinners, lunches, uh, it's Mouth a nice... Mouthwash, yeah. <laughs> as well, sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> a nice bottle mm. of maybe seven-year-old Havana Club. Mm. Perfect. How do you like to, to take your rum, you know, in the Havana? My rum uh, it depends where and when, but if it's... Uh, Usually, it's just uh, with ice and straight. So I'm not going to find you at the Big Daiquiri? Uh, <laughs> you can no. do that. You can go to the Floridita and have, of course, what Hemingway drank. Yeah. You can have a mojito. The you mojito. can have the mojito is Cuba Libre. Yeah. 
which sounds crazy, but it's you know Coca-Cola and rum. Yeah. Those are all available, but nothing beats the pure rum with a, a cube ice. of ice. Yeah. It's, it's one of the few things I know in Spanish. Yeah. Un ron con hielo, por favor. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, gentlemen, I mean, it's with great excitement that I say that the next time we see one another uh, will be in Cuba. But what's uh, impossible to end on any higher note than that. So, gentlemen, uh, thank you so much for your time. Thank, thank you, you so much for allowing thank me to, you. Uh, you know, to share this moment with you both and for indulging me in your you know, exclusive company uh, in this beautiful shop. Uh, smoking this incredible Davidoff number one. Oh, uh, it's Kirby, a pleasure. Uh, you, you know how delighted we are to have you here with us, and you know what an honor it is for us. And for us, we see how hard you work when you're here. Your time is extremely precious. We are the beneficiaries, the lucky beneficiaries of your presence. So thank you so much, Kirby, for yeah. spending a little bit of that time yeah. with us. Well, you're too kind, and uh, thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Yeah, see you in Cuba. Yes, on the, <laughs> on the terrace of the Kempinski Hotel yes, upstairs. Yes, absolutely. The first cigar, we, well, the first time we see each other, probably will be there once we check in. I, I know where we, I'll find you. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> which is, uh, you know, Next to the pool. You know. uh, Eddie, where's dad? Uh, well, he's, uh, you know. He's, he's buying a few cigars. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Hasta luego. Yes. <laughs>